Me too. Is I think we've got everybody back. Yeah, let's, I see Mr. Peterson. Okay. Um, the department may call their next witness. Um, Judge, have we, um, was Ms. Goucher released yet? I, I have a, one more question for her real quick. Oh, no, she's, she's still with us. Ms. Goucher, quick question. Um, has there ever been any domestic violence between you and uh, Mr. Peterson? No. None ever at all? Once a long, long time ago. Okay, so there has been. A long, long time ago. Like years ago. Like when we first met. I appreciate you, Honor. That, that was the only question. Any other follow up? No, okay. Sir. The department may call its next witness. We would call um, Mr. Peterson again, real quick, Your Honor, if I may. Okay, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson, have, I think we discussed it once, but you, you said something that I forgot to ask you about. Um, you had said that you had had a, I believe it was a domestic violence charge that you were convicted of, and then it went away. What, what do you mean by that? So basically, it was that what Gloria just said, it was against her. She went in um, afterwards and told the police that I didn't do anything, that she wanted to drop all charges. Okay, but you you said you were convicted. So how do, how do you mean it went away? So the way the state of Michigan does things is very different than the way a lot of other states do things. In the state of Michigan, for example, if let's say Santa Claus hits Mrs. Claus and she calls the police, you're held for 72 hours. You're technically convicted of the crime, but you're not charged. So in the state of Michigan, they have conviction and then they have charge. Okay. So you're saying a conviction in Michigan doesn't have the normal meaning as conviction everywhere else in the legal world? Judge, I'm, I'm, I need to object to that question. My client is not qualified to give uh, a legal opinion. You, Your Honor, I believe he said he has his law degree. He did say he has a law degree. So uh, that, that's normally not our case i that does i'm going to be honest that doesn't make any sense to me either and i i don't want to have the impression that he got convicted of something and, and he really didn't so uh I, I mean i'd like to clear that up however we can do that i just uh are you russell are you sure you don't mean you were indicted for it or or charged and then when she wanted to drop charges it went away when when she went in and told the police that she wanted all charges dropped against me. They dismissed the case. Okay. You, had you ever pled guilty to it? I had. I was in the process of getting ready to plead guilty to it until the attorneys came in and said, we spoke with Ms. Goucher. She said that she is not willing to proceed with the case, and they dropped it. So you never went in front of a judge, and the judge pronounced your guilt. I went right? for a video. I went for uh, arraignment. Right. But you never pled out and received any kind of judgment against you that said no you were okay all right that clears that up I, I i had a question about that too so um is that the only criminal offense that you've had no that's not the only criminal offense i've had it was stated earlier that i had a warrant out of uh, the state of north carolina do you have any pleas or convictions on anything else uh the sex offense thing yes okay. do you have a Oh, and then there was one out of, uh, where the heck was that? Uh, Pennsylvania, but that was back in like 2013. Okay. Um, in the state of Michigan, do you have two convictions for, um, well, excuse me, one for failure to register as a sex offender and one uh, refusing or failing to pay registration fees for the sex offender. They're actually both the same thing. Um, they're both for failing to pay the registration fee of fifty dollars okay. every time that you go in to verify the address. But you have two convictions for that. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you have a conviction for aggravated assault from that was out of Pennsylvania. Well, that you say so you have that out of Pennsylvania. Yes, that's out of Pennsylvania. Okay. And your honor, I just emailed something out 
uh, an exhibit out to all the attorneys um, and to you and Rachel. I'm also, um, I know I don't have Mr. Peterson and Ms. Goucher's email addresses, so um, I will try to do a screen share so that they can see what I'm looking at if I do it for the right screen. I, I'd like an offer before you screen share. I don't know what it is, and, and asking some of my age to switch over off of to my emails. Well, and, and I was gonna say I emailed it to you, man. Can you can you check I, your email? I, I I think I can, but how do I get back to where y'all are? I'm gonna try, and if I get back, I get back. I'm gonna try and close this and get back to look at that. I learned something. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I just want y'all to look at it, and I'll try to screen share it so that everybody can see what we're looking at when we we're talking about this. Um, if I can remember how to screen share. You have to ask permission, don't you? And then we have to grant it. Yeah, I think I do. I forgot about that. Um, may I have permission to share something from the screen, Your Honor? And it's the exhibit that I just sent out to everybody. Let me see if this does it. No, I'm sharing my screen. You're sharing right. your screen. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just have to enable the screen share so that I can do it. And I don't know how that works. Give it, Judge. Okay. Can, can y'all see that screen now? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Peterson, um, excuse me first. Your Honor, I'd, I'd like to admit exhibit number one. It is a um, record from the official web, Michigan website for uh, their Department of Corrections. Um, it'd be self-authenticating as a uh, the official government website. Any objections? I object, Your Honor. My case is technically supposed hang on, to be hang on. sealed. Russ, Russell, Russell, hang on, hang on. Daniel, if you'll scroll through that slowly, slowly. Shouldn't even be allowed. I got it. I got it. Uh, no, I mean it's hearsay, Judge. That's my objection. It's not. Oh. It's it's off a web page. It's not self authenticating. You know, anyone can go on the internet and find this type of stuff. It's it, it's just hearsay, Judge. That's my objection. I, mean, I I believe your objection goes to the weight and not the admissibility. And I'll admit this is number one. Yes, sir. Exhibit I'll admit one. exhibit one. And it's it's a what I sent out was a printout of this so that everybody would have a hard copy of it. But it's the um, okay. So, and I'm sorry. Were there any other other objections or just admitted, Your Honor? No, I've, I've admitted. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Peterson, you said a second ago that you had an aggravated assault out of Pennsylvania. Is that correct? That is correct. So this aggravated assault on this record that's in, from Michigan's web, uh, Department of Corrections, was this you also? Yes, that is me, and that is the charge out of Michigan. If you look at sentence two, sentence three, do you see where it says where it says County Wayne, County Wayne, and then the other one false report of bomb threat where it says County nothing. And then if you look at the first one, it says County and nothing by it. That's because they are out of state. And that's yeah. also if you look at sentence four, if you would scroll down, please. Where it says interest closed for interstate order, it is out of state. Yeah. Um, but you took pleas on all four of these, correct? Yes. Okay, so these are all convictions. Yes, and I did absolutely no time for any of them except for the sex offense okay. charges. I did probation, and that was it. Okay. And everything has been completely discharged. As you clearly see, it says offender discharged on all of them, and it even says on my current status, discharged. Yes, and judge, not responsive. I'm, my question was over. This thing. So, Mr. Payson, earlier um, you had testified that if the child was returned to you, um, that if you didn't weren't able to get into the uh, daycare right then, that you had some people at the office that could watch the child. Is that correct? Which you testified to? That is correct. I had and then, asked, and then you heard um, your employer state that is not the case. Correct. That is correct. May I? Say something else, or am I going to get shut down for that too? Just wait, wait for a question, Russell, and I'll, I'll make the objections. Um, so, having heard that, what would be your plan then? Objection, Judge. The purpose of today's hearing is to determine whether or not the state can prove the allegations 
on an adversary proceeding to remove the child. And those, those uh, requisite findings are that Russell, on the date of the removal, was a danger to the physical health or safety of the child. What we're going to do going forward, Judge, frankly, is irrelevant. Listen, I'm a human. I, I know it's relevant because we want to make sure this child is cared for. But the purpose of today's hearing is to determine whether or not the state had a basis to remove the child as of the date of the removal. It's not what's going to happen going forward. That's my well, objection. You're correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the standard is, is it a continuing danger to the child? And so what's going to happen to the child five minutes from now is totally relevant. I, agree. I, mean, I would also say Mr. Noack's the one that asked the question about how he would care for the child and brought up, open the door on that to um, what's going to happen down the road. Sure, the door's been opened on that as well. So I'll, I'll allow the question. Okay. So to further answer your question then, yes, I heard what Carly said. However, Carly does not know who I talked to at the office about them watching my child. I don't have to, you know, relay everything that I do at my company as of course, I am out in the open. I have the right to the freedom of speech. I have the right to ask whoever it is at my company any question that I so choose to ask. And I don't have to relay it back to my owner of the company, being Carly Shilly. Yeah. So, yes, I have other options that Carly does not know about. What are those? Again, I asked a few people at the office if they would be willing to watch her, and they said yes. Yeah. Is that while they are at work or is that on their own time? That would be while they're either A, at work, or B, if my day continues on past 4 o'clock, then they would take her home and then I would pick them up from there. Or right. they would meet me back at the office and I would pick her up. Being a part owner of the business, do you think that Carly has the right to say people cannot watch run a daycare while at our office? I do, yes. However, she did not say that nobody had the right to do that. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Any follow-up from anyone? I have one. Okay, go ahead. Um, Mr. Peterson, on April 27th, uh, you and Ms. Goucher were scheduled for a visit with your daughter. Why did neither of you appear? Well, number one, I was sitting there and I even told Casey this, I was waiting on the Uber to arrive. However, the Uber did not arrive on time to it. Plus, I also was not feeling well. Gloria could have went because Gloria was feeling just fine. I'm only speaking for myself on this matter. Real quick, Judge. Yeah. On, uh, Russell, on the 27th, were you still recovering from your heart issues? Uh, yes, I was. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Um, we call uh, Teresa DeBalt real quick, John. And how are you employed? I'm employed with the Department of Family and Protective Services. And in what capacity? I'm a supervisor in investigations. Okay. And... You're familiar with the case we're discussing involving the child. Uh, I'm Casey's yeah. supervisor. Okay. And um, you've heard, you've been here and heard the testimony today, correct? Yes. And you've heard all the testimony about um, CPS involvement in Michigan. Yes. Okay. Um, has the department, y'all, reached out to Michigan? Yes. And have y'all... Um, made contact with them about this? Yes. Are they familiar with who Mr. Peterson and Ms. Goucher are? Yes. Um, were, were you notified of more than one CPS case? Yes. How many CPS cases were you notified of? Twelve. Twelve? Yes. And what did those cases involve? Judge, objection. This is clearly hearsay. I should have objected earlier. This is hearsay. And Judge, here's a, it's also rebuttal witness to um, Mr. Bott has had contact with CPS, had, had discussions with them as far as these parents. We heard that um, Mr. Peterson say and Ms. Goucher say they've only had one case. It is a rebuttal, strictly rebuttal to what their testimony was for the truthfulness of that testimony. Well, but I think Mr. Nowak needs to be provided an opportunity to check that by either questioning the witness that this witness talked to or reviewing the documents 
that this witness is relying upon? Are either of those available today? They, it was a um, phone conversation, Your Honor, and the, okay. the witness is in training and not able to be here. Okay. Well, since Mr. Nowak has no opportunity to cross-examine that person, I'll sustain the objection. Thank you, um, I have no further questions at this time. Mr. Nowak? Yes. Uh, Ms. DeBall, it's good to see you again. Um, you don't have any personal knowledge that Russell Peterson is a danger to the physical health or safety of Jasmine, do you? No. What efforts have, has the department made, to your knowledge, if you have any knowledge on this, what efforts has the department made to return the child to Mr. Peterson? There hasn't been an opportunity to return the child to Mr. Peterson. So it's correct that no efforts have been made, correct? Yes, correct. As far as you know, there's no continuing danger to return Jasmine to Mr. Peterson, correct? There are concerns. Ma'am, I'm asking for your personal knowledge. Do you have any personal knowledge that it would be a danger to re return Jasmine to Mr. Peterson? The answer is no, correct? From the information that you have received through our- I'm talking about your personal knowledge. I do have some, yes. Have you spoken to Mr. Peterson? No. Have you spoken to Jasmine? No. Have you spoken to Gloria? No. Have you been to where they lived? No. Did you see how they were living? No. Do you know how they're going to live in the future? No. Is Casey going to testify? To your knowledge? Yes. Okay. I want to talk to whoever is in the know. You're the supervisor here, correct? Yes. You're relying on what people told you, correct? Yes. You don't have any personal knowledge to tell Judge Board, correct? Correct. Pass the witness, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Hammonds? Ms. DeBall, in these uh, investigative affidavits that are attached to these petitions, one of the, con the, well, the conclusion, subsection nine, it says that all reasonable efforts consistent with time and circumstances have been made by the Department of Family and Protective Services to prevent or eliminate the need for removal of Jasmine Peterson. Are you familiar with those? Yes. Conclusions? Okay. Uh, in your uh, review of this whole situation, were you aware that a conversation was held with the hospital personnel at the nursery before Jasmine was removed? Uh, it depends on who that was with or between who? Between Casey and the nursing personnel up there? Yes. I mean, were you aware that the hospital would be willing to make provisions when Mr. Peterson went into the hospital to have his heart surgery, the hospital would have been able to make provisions to put Jasmine in their nursery and would have held her until Mr. Peterson was released. Were you aware of that? No. Okay. As a supervisor, have you ever seen that happen? No. Okay. I have nothing further, Judge. Ms. Zavala? The investigation um, on Jasmine started back when she was in the hospital at birth. Is that correct? Correct. And um, the department provided uh, Mr. Peterson and Ms. Goucher a crib so that she would have a place to, to stay when they were released? To my knowledge. Okay. Yes. And um, they paid... $600 for two weeks in a hotel? Yes, I signed up on that. So they were they were working from the beginning to prevent removal before this incident. Correct. And after, at the time of actual removal, Mr. Peterson was in the hospital and Ms. Goucher was had been arrested? Correct. And after Mr. Peterson was released, were there still concerns about his knowledge regarding Ms. Goucher? Yes. I pass the witness. Quick, quick follow-up, Judge. Sure. Ms. DeBalt, 
someone having a heart attack is not a basis for removal of a child, correct? No. You don't fault Mr. Peterson for having his heart attack, correct? Correct. And that's not the reason you remove the child from Mr. Peterson, is it? No. Okay. So what I need from you, Ms. DeBall, is every fact that you have personal knowledge of, of why you removed Jasmine from Mr. Peterson. Every fact that I have came from my investigator. So you just don't know. Personally, I did not investigate this case. Casey would be the witness. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Katrina. That's all I have, Judge. Ms. DeBall, I'm going to show my ignorance here because, you know, as a district judge for 20 years, we had other judges that heard these cases. And so I just never was exposed to them until I became a visiting judge. But assume with me just for for purposes of illustration that I was a single dad. I didn't have any family or contacts here in Amarillo. I was caring, let's say my my wife and the mother of my child died and I was caring for that child, but I was working full time and and that kind of thing. And I had a heart attack and there was no no family to take that child. I mean, at that point, would CPS be able to step in at least on an emergency basis and temporarily find placement for that child until I got back on my feet? Yes, sir. I mean, I would hope to think I didn't just leave the child in a box out in a parking lot or something, right? Correct. So what's the standard? And maybe this is a better question for the lawyers, but what's your understanding of the standard you would apply in the situation I just gave you? That we would put the child into a safe environment until the parent could um, continue parenting the child safely. Okay. And that helps me. It's sometimes just a, an example helps me kind of understand. Any other questions for her? Okay. The, the state, or I'm sorry, the department may call its next witness. We'd call uh, Casey Swarhart. Okay. And Casey, I did swear you in earlier. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Very good. Go ahead. Casey, could you state your name for the record, please? Casey Swihart. And Casey, how are you employed? I'm an investigator for the Department of Family and Protective Services. And you're familiar with the case that we've been hearing this afternoon? Yes. Involving uh, Jeff? Yes. And how are you familiar with that case? I'm the investigator for the family. And from the start of this case, we, we heard testimony from both parents as far as um what happened at the hospital that started this, where the first call came in, um, up until removal, correct? Yeah. Um, from the first call at the hospital, you worked with the family, is that correct? That is correct. And when they were discharged um, from the hospital, you worked with them in order to take the child, you helped them get a hotel room? That is correct. Um, and I believe... This one came out a while ago that CPS paid for the first two weeks, I believe. Yes. Um, provided a crib. Yes. Uh, formula, food, uh, diapers, any of that? Um, we did not provide any of that. We offered a stroller, but they did not want one. Okay. Um, I think I remember seeing something in the report that uh, formula and diapers were still at the hospital. Is that correct? Did y'all move that stuff from the hospital over? Uh, yes, I transported Gloria and the baby from the hospital to the hotel as they did not have a ride to get to the motel. Okay. Um, where was where was dad? Was he on the road or was he? No, said, he was at the hotel at that time. Did, did you have to take him over or did he drive the truck over? Uh, he was in his own truck. Okay. Um, and you checked on him and worked with the family in order to prevent removal. That is correct. Okay. Um, Besides living in the truck and in the sleeper cab, um, and not that it's a bar to having a child, but they were essentially homeless besides living in the truck. Is that correct? Up until the birth of Jasmine, yes, that is correct. Okay. When did you get a call as to the mother had been arrested and dad had had a heart attack? So I had a missed call from Russell on April 20th. It was after 5 p.m. Um, and I did not get it until the next morning. And that is also when I received the new intake that was reported for the family. Okay. Um, and when all of this happened, where was the, the, where did you pick up the child from? The hotel room. Okay. And that was with the Smiths? 
Yes, that is correct. Room 117. And was that, was the child, uh, Mr. Peterson stated that the child was given to the Smiths by the APD. Was that your that is, understanding? That's my understanding, yes. Was it, is it common in a situation for like that, that APD doesn't call y'all? Not necessarily, though sometimes that does happen. It does happen that they'll leave it with somebody else. Yes. Um, is that normally at the advice of one of the parents at the time, or is that? Yes. The, okay. Yes. Um, was it your understanding on this one that one of the parents advised to give the child to them? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. When did uh, Ms. Goucher get out of jail? She got out of jail the afternoon of April 21st. Okay. Um, and when did uh, Mr. Peterson get out of the hospital? I believe he got out of the hospital that following Saturday or Sunday. Okay. What date was August or April 20th? What day was that? A April 20th was a Thursday. Okay. And I initiated going back out there after the new report on April 21st, which was a Friday. Okay. And then he got out on two days later on a Sunday. Is that what you're saying? That is what I believe. Yes. Okay. Where did he go after he got out of the hospital? He went back to the motel room that he shares with Gloria Goucher. So he went back to the house where the mother was. Correct. And this was the same mother that um, admitted a while ago that she had drank and passed out to the point that she had passed out with a 13 day old baby in the room for at least. That, is, that is correct. Okay. Um, you heard the testimony earlier that um, dad is driving a truck. Yes. Um, does from the testimony you heard, do you believe that um, he has, I don't think I'll phrase it, um, adequate child care set up for if the child would return? I do not believe anything stable is in place at this time. Do you believe that it is a, um, would be a danger to have a one month old baby driving around the country in a 18 week? Yes, I do. Do you believe that that, um, would be a healthy environment for a child at that age? I do not. Okay. Um, do you believe that that it could lend to a um, possible emotional, physical or, um, I hate to say emotional because it's such a young baby, but um, ongoing danger to have the child Ob strapped into an uh, uh, Objection, objection, Judge. I'm, I'm, I'm Two fronts. Number one, I don't think the state has proved evidence of a danger at removal. Number one. Number two, uh, ongoing is she's going to be speculating what's happening in the future. Those are my objections, Judge. Let me just make sure I'm not, you know, considering the wrong factors, but I'm sitting here looking in the handy dandy book Judge Baker left behind on the adversary hearing checklist. And I, I'm going to give Russell the benefit of the doubt and say he's a parent before the court who was not involved in the circumstances regarding removal. Now, I do think he was, but it wasn't his fault. I'm not going to fault a guy for having a heart attack. So, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say he did something wrong intentionally, but I mean, those that was a factor that factored in the removal, but I'll treat him as a parent that didn't necessitate that. One of the factors this says I can consider is possession of the child by the parent constitutes a continuing danger to the child, despite reasonable efforts by DFPS to enable that person's possession. And it quotes Texas Family Code section 262.201G-1. Now, if, if I'm not supposed to be applying that standard, then I won't, but that's my assumption. And so when we're asking about adequate child care and whether a child can even be in the semi truck or people are willing to take care of the child at work or whether we have relatives here or whether the people that previously cared for the child are inappropriate for that. I think those are all factors I'm supposed to weigh in making that determination. But again, if I'm incorrect, correct me and tell me the right standard and I'll, I'll shift gears. And, and, and once again, Judge, I, I'm representing Russell, not Gloria. Right. I'm, I, I believe I'm looking at the same code section, 262.201. Uh, and the way it reads is, unless the court finds sufficient evidence to satisfy a person of ordinary prudence and caution that, 
there was a danger to the physical health or safety of the child. And I'm looking at that judge from the standpoint of my client, Russell. I will concede, as I think I must, that when Russell found Gloria in the room, unresponsive with the child, that that was definitely a danger to the child. But I think that has more to do with Gloria than it does with Russell. Um, and I, I think that is what the court needs to find, that, that my guy created a physical, uh, a danger to the physical health or safety of the child. I, I think so far the evidence I heard, Judge, is that my guy was the only one, you know, that called 911 several times that night and, and got help not only for the mom of his child, but for the child it, it itself, herself. And then after that, you know, he had a heart attack. It, that, that's my objection, Judge. I, I, I just think that they need to prove against Russell that he was a danger to the child at the time of removal. And I just don't think they can meet that burden, Judge. And that's, that's not my reading of the applicable statute, so I'll overrule your objection. Yes, sir. Um, you I'm sorry, sir. No, I, had go a, ahead. I had a delay there. I didn't hear what you like. Did you say I could continue? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you, we heard testimony earlier from the dad. He knew mom had had a drinking problem and a problem with alcohol for at least six to seven years. Is that correct? That is correct. And understandably, he has to work, but he left that child unattended with a mother he knew had a drinking problem in a hotel room. That is correct. Um, and you heard from the mother that the she drank to the point of being unconscious and the baby being left in the hotel room by itself. That is correct. May I please have a breakout room with my attorney? No, sir. You, if we are going to call you again as a witness, we can do that when we're finished with this witness. You can continue, counsel. Thank you. Um, you need me to tell you your last question, David? Yeah, give me my last question, please. Um, you said, and you heard from the mother that she drank to the point of being unconscious and the baby was left in the hotel room by itself. That is correct. And I have the name well, with me. So, Your Honor, may we mute Ms. Goucher? Folks, I've been very patient, and I know we've been going a long time today, and I'm going to continue to be patient. But I want you to know that your demeanor and your actions today play on this court's judgment. And when you're combative, or when you interrupt, or when you're, uh, you know, doing things you're not supposed to do, that's going to affect my judgment. So I would suggest to you that you be kind and courteous and respectful of this court and of this process. And that will bode you very well in the end when it comes time for this court to make a decision. Okay? Thank you. Counsel, you may continue. Now, Ms. Wahart, do you know, we, we spoke a while ago, the parents one of the parents advised APD they could leave the child with dismiss. Is that correct? That is correct. And one of um, you heard Mr. Peterson testify earlier that he did was aware that the Smiths, whether it was recent or knew about the recent, but he knew from conversations with them that they had CPS history. Yes. And he still advised APD to leave that 13 day old baby with a family in a next door in a hotel room yes that they had only been around for about a week yes and had cps history yes do you believe that that was in the best interest of that child i do not do you believe that the actions of both parents at that time were opposite of in the best interest of the child yes um today is the is the department asking for the court to order the continued temporary managing conservator of the child, Jasmine. Uh, yes. And are you asking for that for in the best interest of the child? Yes. Um, are you asking that parents work services? Yes. The child be cared for? Yes. And when parents hit a point, if they make it to that point, that it would be working toward reunification of that child with those parents? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you heard Mama say, the mother say earlier that she uh, believes that she needs some help mm -hmm. yes. to work services. Um, and in these type of cases, if the parents get to that point, 
they're normally standard year cases is the timelines, correct? I'm sorry, say that again? The standard for a timeline on a case like this is a year, correct? Correct. Okay. And there are instances where um, things get sorted out shorter than that and parents work on things and children are reunited quicker than that, correct? Absolutely, yes. And that is something that would um, be on the table if the court decides to give the department TMC. Yes. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. You know what? Um, Miss, is it Swihart? Yes. Sometimes I might call you Casey, and I apologize if I do in, in advance. Um, what what day did you pick up Jasmine? What day did the department take possession of Jasmine? That was April twenty first. And where was Mr. Peterson on April twenty first? He was in the BSA hospital after having a heart attack. Is it fair to say that had he not had his heart, had his heart attack? that you would not have picked up Jasmine? My intention of going out there was to assess for safety, um, but since he was in the hospital, um, that was our option at that time. That was your only option at that point, correct? Correct. Because Gloria had her issues that we've heard about today, correct? Correct. And 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 Russell was in the hospital dealing with his heart attack issue, correct? Correct. Now, had Russell been home, and providing a suitable environment for Jasmine, you would not have removed the child, correct? I cannot say that is 100% correct. Well, let, let me ask that again. Had Russell been home, and I know that home at that time was a motel room, but had he been home and providing a safe environment for the child, you would not have removed the child from Russell, correct? Had we been able to create a plan for safety, then correct. CPS gets to order, judges get to order plans after children are removed. Do you understand that, correct? Yes, I do. And you understand that to remove a child, you have to meet a certain burden, correct? That is correct. And you understand that the burden is that at that given time that there's a danger to the physical health and safety of the child. You understand that, correct? Yes, I do. Had Mr. Peterson not had a heart attack and been home caring appropriately for Jasmine, you would not have had grounds to remove Jasmine, correct? If there was appropriate care for Jasmine, then that is correct. And you couldn't, that couldn't happen because he was in the heart, he was in the hospital with a heart attack, correct? At that time, yes. So had he not had a heart attack, Jasmine could still be with him, correct? Potentially, yes. Do you have any information that Russell is a danger to the health or safety of Jasmine? Personal knowledge. Personal knowledge, there are some concerns for ongoing safety. Okay, I, I appreciate that answer, but that, that wasn't my question. As of the day of removal, but for him being in the hospital with a heart attack, you did not have grounds to remove the child from Russell Peterson, correct? At that time, he was not a fit caregiver. Because he had a heart attack, right? Correct. I'm a single dad. I've had heart issues. You're going to remove my kids because I'm in the hospital with a heart attack? If you do not have a support system or some appropriate place for the child to go, then that would be an option, yes. What efforts have you made to return the child to Russell? As of today, uh, none since removal. You understand that you're required to make reasonable efforts to return the child. You understand that, right? Yes. And your testimony is as of today's adversary hearing, you have made no efforts, correct? Correct. Pass the witness, Judge. Ms. Swihart, when you've got a man in a truck on the road, are you going to drive out to wherever he is and hand the child back to him? No. So would his voluntary removal from this jurisdiction currently prevent that? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hammonds? Ms. Swihart, how long have you been with the department? Six years. Have you had a circumstance that you can even think that was close to this one where I'm going to say a non-offending parent was placed in the hospital immediately, and you had to make a decision very quickly about the safety of the child? No, I will say I've not dealt with this specific situation before. Okay. Did you ever discuss the policy of the hospital in this particular situation? Russell and I had that conversation, but I had not spoken to any uh, hospital staff regarding that. Okay. Uh what did Russell indicate to you 
his conversation with the hospital consisted of? Um, he informed me that the hospital was willing to keep the baby in the NICU or in the, the pediatrics part, whatever, whatever nursery um, that they had an available bed for her um, while he was recovering. Okay. Did you take it upon yourself to go ask those questions? I did not know. So you don't know at this moment if the hospital, for instance, has dealt with this situation before, and they've even kept young children up there 24 hours a day, they're staffed 24 hours a day until the parent is released. That is correct. You don't know if that happens or not. That is correct. Okay. I have nothing further, Judge. Ms. Zavala? Ms. Swihart, um, you know, I understand that the removal took place on Friday? Yes. Okay. And then it sounds like um, just a few days later on either Saturday or Sunday, uh, Mr. Peterson was released? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And at that time, he went home and lived with Miss Goucher? That is correct. Would it have been a safe and appropriate place to place the baby back with in a home where Miss Goucher was? No. Um, they... They were scheduled for a joint visit on 427, and were they able to attend that visit? They did not attend. Um, and at that point, they were they were still living together. That is correct. And in fact, I believe the testimony is, is that when he gets back, that'll be the first time that they're not living together. That is correct. And so other than when he was in the home with Miss Goucher, or too sick to come visit the child. Then the next thing that happened was that he got in his truck and left the area. That is correct. So has there ever been an opportunity to return the baby to a place that would be safe for her? No, ma'am. I pass on this. Um, th 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 this does occur to me, even though I don't have much experience, that this is just a totally unique situation. But assume with me for a moment that uh, the father returns to Amarillo and that he, once upon his return, he actually determines the name and address and contact information of a reputable daycare that's willing to take care of that child and that he can ensure the department that his work hours will accommodate him being able to care for the child when the child's not in daycare or that there's some other vetted person that can is qualified and approved to to do that care at that point well and assume with me that he's serious about uh, at least for the time being cutting off contact with the mother at that point would the department then be willing to consider returning the child to the father yes if all those safety measures were put in place then that would be an option and, and again i'm going to show my ignorance does this court have the discretion to set another hearing in a very short period of time to allow that to happen? Or does he have to wait until whenever the next hearing is scheduled to, to raise those matters? The court has that discretion. Okay. I, it'd probably be prompted by a motion from me. And, and Judge, you asked, you know, we've been here for three hours now, I think. <laughs> you summed it up in one, one question. And thank you for that. Uh, the court has a discretion to set it. It'd be prompted probably by a motion from me. But okay. excellent, excellent observation. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Anybody have any follow up after that? No. No. Okay. Judge, um, judge, if I could, judge, if I could just ask her real quick, uh, oh, Miss Whitehart. Miss Whitehart, the judge also has the discretion today to order the department to exercise uh, a family-based service plan, for instance, rather than continuing temporary managing conservatorship. Correct. Yes where you monitor them, it could even be daily or every other day for a short period of time, say seven to 14 days, to see if everything has been put in place that we've discussed. No, the agency doesn't have the resources to do that type of close monitoring um, every day. Okay, so it's just like once a week. That more likely, yes. Okay, nothing further, Judge. All right, the department may call its next witness. No more witnesses, Your Honor. All right, very good. And uh, Mr. Ammons, do you have any witnesses you'd like to call? I do not, Judge. 
Mr. Noack, do you have any additional witnesses you'd like to call? I, I think we've covered everything, Josh. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zavala, any witnesses? And if not, do you have a recommendation for the court as the ad litem? Uh, no witnesses, Your Honor. Um, at this point, my recommendation would be um, for the department to be named temporary managing conservator of the child. Um, I do agree that right now there is a continuing danger to the child. Um, and as pointed out by the court, that could be addressed in the future if those concerns are alleviated. But that is my recommendation at this time. I've also uh, reached out to placement and, and the child is doing well. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, let me give everybody an opportunity to give me a closing remark, but just just so we're all on the same page. And again, I, you know, uh, I've been doing this long enough to know that sometimes I don't apply the right standards or make mistakes, and I, I don't want to do that. I really want to apply the correct standard. But um, it seems to me that different standards apply to Ms. Goucher than apply to, to uh, the father. And... So, I, but, but if I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, I still think under 262.201G-1-2 uh, that if reasonable efforts have been made to return the child, and in this case, I don't believe there's been any opportunity due to the actions of the father, and I'm not saying they're bad. I understand why he had to go get his driver's license renewed to make a living, but there just hasn't been really a chance to make that connection. So I'm going to say that's, you know, reasonable efforts have been made because there really wasn't any opportunity. So then the question is, is continue, is allowing the father to pick the child up when he gets back to town uh, a continuing danger? And here's my thoughts on that. If, if we had set in stone that we had daycare arranged, if we, uh, whether that's at a licensed facility or someone that's approved or whatever, uh, you know, but uh, it seems to me right now, there's no guarantee that that child has adequate care. And particularly if dad has to earn a living and is out on the road. And I'm, you know, the, the most credible in evidence in this case to me is the testimony of the employer. I mean, she doesn't have a dog in this hunt. She's just here to tell us the way things are. And under their rules, that child cannot be in that truck. So, you know, there's got to be someplace safe to leave that child and, and based on that child's very young age, um, I just have some real concerns about that. I'm not, again, I'm not cast, casting dispersions at anybody. Sometimes life just dictates circumstances we have to deal with. But all that said, I, I would like to give the father a very quick opportunity to address those concerns that I have. And, and if he can alleviate those that I, I mean I, I think it probably is appropriate for him to be reunited with the child so that said I, I still would allow you guys to make closing remarks and I, I mean anything you say might change the way I see this go yeah, ahead Mr. So, yeah we, we as we're here for today we're asking for temporary managing conservatorship we, we have laid out as you just discussed that children can be reunited quicker than the year Kate set out in a case. Um, there are a lot of variables right now as we've seen throughout the day that nothing is setting stone and we don't have um, verification that this baby has a safe place to go when dad comes into town. Um, we heard that he's not really on local runs. He may be making longer runs. They can't guarantee that he'll be home every night. Baby can't go home with mom at this point. As she said through her testimony, she needs, um, she believes she needs some help and possibly inpatient help or some sort of counseling to get herself together. Um, now, that's we're not asking to keep the child for the full year. We're asking to make sure the child is safe at this time um, until the parents can get to a point to be able to take care of the, of the child on their own. Um, there are, there's too many variables open right now that, we don't believe the child would be safe just getting in the truck with dad. We heard that from both parents that they are being evicted. Dad says he's not, but that they're possibly being kicked out of the hotel. Uh, whether that's both parents or one parent, we're not sure at this time. Um, he's still another day from being here. Um, and we don't know where he's going. He's applied for some housing, but he hasn't gotten word on that housing yet. 
So if we the child was to be returned, he would be riding shotgun in an 18 wheeler at a month old baby. Um, and there's no certainty of any sort of standard of care um, or if something were to happen and he's on the road where that baby would go. Um, dad just had a heart attack and that is not to be held against them. That is, I hate to have that happen, but he could easily have something happen again while he's driving or on the road if that baby is with him. Um, so until there's more concrete um, safety measures for this baby, uh, we would ask for temporary management conservatorship to the department and um, reconvene at the status here in down the road. Very good, Mr. Hammonds. Judge, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm gonna defer to Mr. Nowak. I'm kind of in his wagon and I think he's gonna have probably some good suggestions for you. Thank you, Judge. Very good, Mr. Nowak. Thank you so much, Judge, and thank you, TD. Um, First of all, TD, I really meant what I said. I mean, Diane Gilmore works miracles at Downtown Women's Center, and I hope Gloria Googles DWC. Judge, I think the standard is applied as of the date of removal. And I, I think Casey and Katrisha both told the court that absent the heart attack, absent you know Russell's heart attack, the child would not have been removed. Um, I don't think it's fair to hold it against him that he's on the road for part of his job. I don't think... I understand on a human level, Judge, looking forward, okay, well, if we give this kid back to Russell, what's our child care situation? You know, what, what, what's going forward? How do we protect this child? But, and I think those are valid concerns, Judge, but I think we need to look back at the date of removal. And on the date of removal, the only thing that the department has against Russell is he had a heart attack. Um, you've heard testimony that, that he's talked to child care and that he will have child care in place. He'll be back in Amarillo Lamar. He plans on staying here. Um, I, 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 you know, his employer said that, yeah, we don't do daycare, but Russell already told the court that he's got daycare set up. He makes enough money to afford it. Um, I just don't think at the time of removal that the department had the requisite facts to support removal, especially that, you know, you know, we, we didn't make reasonable efforts to return the child to Russell. And, and Judge, believe me, when you said, well, if he's on the road, how, how in the heck can you make reasonable efforts? He was in the hospital. They could have talked to him and said, hey, what are your plans? Um, that didn't happen, Judge. And that is one of the that is one of the three criteria that need to be met before this court can continue the department's possession of the child. Um, having said all of that, I think it would be good for Russell to get back to town and establish himself and then maybe we have another hearing but i don't want to give up my argument judge that the department has not made his case they just they, they simply haven't um, and once again the court knows that you know my kids are all adopted i've had two heart attacks <laughs> you know looking back maybe it would have been a good idea to take them from me <laughs> but i don't think it's fair to hold it against russell that he happened to have a heart attack uh, when all of this was happening um, I, I just don't think the department has met its burden, Judge. And I, I, I think the proper order is to return the trial to Russell, along with, I'm here to say, I agree, you know, if, if Casey or Katrisa want to, want to, you know, suggest that we do some family-based services, it's always a good idea. And Judge, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest proponent of it's free, take advantage of it. And I'm going to encourage Russell to take advantage of whatever services are available. But for purposes of today's hearing, the department has not made its case. They have not met their burden of proving the removal of the child as to Russell. And I could probably go on forever, but you're probably sick of hearing me talk to you. So that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Zavall, anything in addition to your recommendation that you've made? Um, it, Your Honor, I believe that your reading of the law is correct, um, that you have to evaluate the safety of the child at this moment um, and whether there is a continuing danger to that child. Um, I, I think there are arguments to be made um, as to, well, let me just keep it at that. Um, and I, I do believe at this point um, that there is not a safe place to return this child to yet. There may be very well in the future. Um, but as of right now, there is no place to even hand the child over to. Um, so I would... I, I continue my recommendation as as before. And and, and may, may it please the court, just, just real briefly. We're only here because the department alleges that they can they can uh, 
support the findings under 262.101. They can't. They can't judge. Every department witness has testified that Russell is not a danger to this child. Every department witness has testified that they have not made reasonable efforts to return the child to Russell. In a perfect world, yeah, we ought to evaluate every kid every day at what is best for that child. But for purposes of this hearing, Judge, the department has not met its burden for being in front of this court. As, as to Russell Peterson, I think the proper ruling today, Judge, would be to return the child to Russell and maybe offer Gloria some, some services. But as far as my client goes, Judge, the department has not met its burden. May, may I real quick, Aaron? Just two sure. seconds. Um, the burden on this hearing is, is low. It's for prudent and caution. Um, we are to be a prudent, ordinary person looking at caution on this, that we, the evidence did show that um, Mr. Peterson left the baby with a mom that he knew had alcohol problem. He, one of the parents advised to give the child to the Smiths, who they knew had CPS history. As soon as Mr. Peterson got done with, um, recovered from his procedure, he left town. Uh, baby could not be returned to mother. Baby could not be returned to father at that point. Um, yes, he has said that he has uh, daycare set up. He has not given a name and does not know the names of the daycares. Um, he's there's been other discrepancies in his testimony as to how things would work. Um, so, as a prudent, ordinary person and caution standard, I believe that we have met the burden that to look out for the safety of this child at this time, um, which is which is our job is to watch out for this child. Um, we have met our burden. And like I said, there are other options that could come up down the road, but at this time, I believe the uh, most cautious situation would be to allow the child to stay where it is in temporary arranging service ship. Thank you. Based on the evidence and testimony and the recommendation of of the ad litem, uh, I do find that currently, and in, in this case, it's kind of a narrow sliver of time, but I do find that there is a continuing danger. And, and you know, they always tell us at, law, at uh, judges school, rule and run, right? Don't explain yourself. But I think in this case, I, I'd like to explain because I really, I don't want to hold it against Russell that he had a heart attack, and I'm not going to hold that against him. I'm also not going to hold it against him that APD place those children with the neighbors at the hotel. Uh, and I'm not faulting APD for that either. I mean, what do you do in that situation? You just do what you can. And it's a triage situation and you you do what's best. So I'm not holding that against him. I may be holding against him his demeanor in this hearing a little bit because I'd like for him to behave himself a little bit better. But that's uh, I also understand there's frustration and, uh, you know, and recovering from a health problem and that kind of thing. So I'm going to I'm going to figure that's where that comes from and not not anywhere else. But I, I will name the department as the temporary managing conservator. I do find the current placement is appropriate and that it should uh, continue. But again, I, I really want to give Russell an opportunity to get back in town, get solid daycare set up, uh, get the work situation figured out about the ability to be home every night. And if, if that's not going to work with the current employment situation, then perhaps, you know, a different employer might be something that might be uh, a good thing. But let him get back here, get his wits about him and get all that stuff figured out and then have another hearing. Um, and, uh, you know, it probably won't be me. I'm sure Judge Baker will be back, but um, let, let her hear that and make that determination. I don't want a staff to wait months on down the road to do that. With regard to to Ms. Goucher, I mean, she's readily admitted that she'd like some help before even considering having the child return to her. And uh, I, I admire that, you know, ad admitting that you've got, you need some help is a, a great step. And Ms. Goucher, you might not find Mr. Nowak and Mr. Hammonds and Mr. Trout and I agreeing and this is of all, all the time, but I will tell you that Vince's recommendation to go to downtown women's center is absolutely spot on and that's what i would have recommended to you uh, in fact i'll be speaking at their annual luncheon uh, a week from now so 
uh, and I will be staffing with them in the morning in my drug court, and I'm going to give them your name and, and tell them that my hope is that you'll contact them and that they'll consider you for their program. And there are other wonderful, worthy programs in, in this town, particularly for women and particularly for women wanting to reunite with their children. So l- look into that. And, and I don't think you'll be disappointed if you get an opportunity to work with those folks. When Currently, when is our next scheduled hearing? Do we know? June 20th, Judge. Yes, sir. June 20th okay. on the 9 o'clock docket. Okay. Well, my hope is that you can have a hearing prior to that. And I'll, I'll leave a note behind for Judge Baker with my reasoning for that. Um, also, I just need to I'll always inform the parents uh, that failure to comply with uh, the plan and the order of the court can result in continued removal of the children and ultimately can result in termination of parental rights. So be sure and discuss that uh, with your lawyers. And uh, my understanding is the hearing we had scheduled for two o'clock originally, TD got, Rachel's going to reschedule y'all because I think Lorene was the only other person waiting to to have a hearing on that. Correct. Yes, Judge. I, I responded to that text. So Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you, folks. You've been patient. You've waited. And you've spent all afternoon with me, and I, I appreciate that. And again, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to address this and get things squared away here real quick. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. May I Thank ask you. a question? Sure. So I actually have two questions. My, my first question is to the county attorney. Why do you keep referring to me as Mr. Peterson made the recommendation to give the child to the Smiths? I never made that recommendation. The police made that recommendation. Let me me stop you. I I am not blaming you for that. And I totally understand how that happened. And so the evidence shows you were on your way to the hospital and APD did what they felt like was the right thing to do under that circumstances. I'm not, I'm not inferring anything on on you for that. That was their decision. You didn't have any choice in that matter. And so that's not a problem. Okay. And the second thing for the courts and for Casey as well, so that everybody can look into it. The name of the daycares are night and day daycare here in Amarillo. And the other one is Lucia's daycare. L U C I A S. I believe it is. Hey, Russell, if you will email or text that to me, I'll make sure the department gets it. I'll make sure they get it the minute I get it. So text that. I absolutely will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Judge, thank you. It's always good to be in your courtroom. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.